they catch something like half a percent of all the money laundering that they know about. So you, you impose this horrible system on 99% of good people in order to maybe a little bit better help you catch half of a percent of the illegal activity. There's a lot of failing government programs, but that has to be up there among the worst. This episode is brought to you by Luca Tax and Exodus. Stay tuned for more info. Eric, it is so nice to have you here, my friend. How you doing? I'm doing super well. Glad to be here. Nice. Amazing. It's been a uh, busy, bit of a busy week uh, this week. I can imagine uh, maybe minimal sleep. Yeah, the sleep's been okay because everything has like, been set in place now. And so we can talk about it finally. And this, the more stressful stuff was weeks ago, trying to figure out some of these things and get ready to launch. But um, yeah, now it's just nice to be able to talk to people about this. And the reception of our announcement yesterday uh, has been phenomenal. Uh, I texted Charlie Shrem last night. I said, hey, I am bringing Eric Voorhees on the podcast tomorrow. What should I ask him? And he said, you have to talk to Eric about the first day we ever met. So what's the story there? Why did Charlie and maybe what's the backstory with you and Charlie for those who don't know? The first day we ever met. So, yeah. Uh, so Charlie started BitInstant, which I think was like the first Bitcoin company that had ever received like an investment from an investor. Like in some ways it was kind of I don't want to use the real uh, startup, but it was certainly one of the most um, important early companies that got formed. And it allowed people to buy Bitcoin more easily because everyone otherwise had to wire money to Mt. Gox back then. Um, I joined as the third employee there as the head of marketing and communications. And um, so I was living in, in New Hampshire at the time and Charlie was in New York. So I moved down to Brooklyn to join him. Uh, I think the first time that we ever met was was after I had moved down there and we went to this uh, this like startup pitch show where we had a little booth and it was in the armory in uh, in New York. And, um, you know, nobody then knew what Bitcoin was. And I remember just feeling like such a such a small little person hoping for some attention. And um, but Charlie and I hit it off right away. We became great friends and uh, the rest is history. Is there a story behind the first day that you guys ever met? I don't, I'm sure there is. And Charlie <laughs> maybe remember something that I don't. So fill us in. So what's the, so can for, I, I know a lot of folks obviously know Shapeshift and know who you are. Um, and we're going to talk all about DAOs. We're going to talk about shape, Shapeshift moving into a DAO. We're going to talk about DeFi. We're going to talk about, you know, the resurgence of Shapeshift, but could, for folks who don't know your backstory, you got in the space in, I think May of 2011, if I remember mm -hmm. that correctly, which yep. is you know, I think you'll be the first person to ever come on Empire who's seen four crypto or four Bitcoin cycles. So um, could you just yeah. give a little background on like how you got into the industry in 2011? Yeah. Uh, well, it was not an industry in 2011. It was like this little $20 million market cap, $30 little million $20 million market cap, market cap project. <laughs> um, yeah. And I learned about Bitcoin from a Facebook post of a friend. I was up in uh, New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project and one of the other members there had posted about it. And uh, I dismissed it immediately. And then I read another article and I was like, wait a second. And then I read a third article. And what clicked with me was um, realizing that it could not be stopped and it had no center. And it was just this like amazing technology to move value anywhere in the earth, uh, essentially for free without anyone being able to stop it. And then I was completely hooked. So like within an hour, it was just uh, became total, total passion and hobby for me. Um, yeah, I, I just kind of tried learning about it for months and there was no, you know, business opportunities to speak of in Bitcoin back then. Um, I joined uh, BitInstant, uh, as mentioned, in, I guess, late, 20, late 2012. Um, <clears throat> was there for like six or nine months. Um, we had the, the Winklevoss guys invest in BitInstant and we had a big falling out with them, um, which has been well-documented elsewhere. Um, myself and uh, Ira Miller decided to leave BitInstant and move down to Panama for a couple of years, uh, worked on a project called Quinnipult. Um, at the same time, I was also running Satoshi Dice, which was the, the world's largest Bitcoin app, uh, but it was a casino game where you could send in Bitcoin and you'd either win more or, or lose the money and a little bit of dust transaction would be sent back to you. And that was, uh, that was, 
crazy. That was like half of all the Bitcoin transactions back then was just to that one one service. Um, but I I got rid of that. I sold it because I felt like it was too risky to be kind of an outspoken proponent of Bitcoin generally, but also be running the world's biggest Bitcoin casino. I felt like that was that was going to be too much too much controversy, and so I I decided to just stick with um, with Bitcoin itself. Sold sold the casino. And left Coinapult when I wanted to move back to the U.S., back to Colorado, and started Shapeshift back then. And that was uh, early, mid-2014. Nice. And so 2011, Bitcoin's at, what, five bucks? Yeah. It had just passed $5 when I learned about it. And then by the time I could get my money to Mt. Gox, it was like eight or nine dollars. You know, so I lost like almost half of what I could have gotten just because of a one-week bank wire delay. I feel and that so kind of bad thing for you right now, Eric. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I said like five hundred dollars in to get it, and um, all the the early Bitcoin that I was able to buy or mine, I, I lost a lot of it. Like after that first bubble, speculating uh, on the price going back up, and I was using like leveraged trades on Bitcoinica, which was like this amazing platform back in the day to actually do leverage on Bitcoin. And I was like, look, I'm in this fully. I'm going to keep betting that it'll go back up, and I kept betting and kept betting and lost so much Bitcoin. And uh, of course, the price started going back up right after I had run out of Bitcoin to bet. So yeah. that was a that was a good lesson on like markets and timing. But um, yeah, it was uh, pretty, pretty wild. That first bubble took it up from, you know, past a dollar up to about $31 in a few months. And then it slid slowly after that down to $2 over the, like the next nine months. And that was that was a dark time because that was sort so of the fell first 90, 90 plus percent down to two bucks. Yeah. Thir- $31 to, to two is like 95% or something. Yeah. And of course that was its first real bubble. Um, tiny, tiny community. And everyone who was a critic of Bitcoin had every reason to believe that it was done, that like that, it, it was the beanie baby thing. It was the stupid fad and now it's going away look at what the price has done. You've lost 95% of your money, you idiot. And every, every hater, you know, was, was winning the day. Um, there was nothing to look back on and show the resilience that Bitcoin now has. And having gone through multiple bubbles, you know, like it's now demonstrated that strength, but during that first one, it didn't exist. Who were the big like names and like big, big companies in the space back then that people might recognize like Ro- I, Roger Ver. Obviously, was around back then. Uh, was Jesse Powell maybe Charlie? Who's around back then? Jesse Powell was around, but Kraken was not yet created. Um, Roger was probably the most well-known person in the whole ecosystem, at least on the non-technical side. You know, he wasn't an engineer, but um, he was probably the most well-known there. And Roger had made a lot of money in his own businesses before Bitcoin. And so he was like one of the first early people to throw real money at the stuff, both in buying the Bitcoins and inv- investing in dozens of different companies that went on to go do great things. Um, Coinbase obviously hadn't started yet. Uh, BitInstant had just gotten off the ground. Um, Bitcoin businesses tended to be like little eccentric uh, e-commerce sites that sold something and had decided to accept Bitcoin. And that was like the Bitcoin industry. So like the, the alpaca socks was a, a very early one. There's this like alpaca farm in New England and they sold these wonderful, warm, cozy wool socks for Bitcoin. Um, so I think I have a pair of like 10 Bitcoin wool socks that I have from back in that day. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, that was that was most of it. It was uh, it was tiny. Do you keep in touch with some of those? Then, you know, everyone likes to throw the term OG. Do you keep around with some of those OG folks? Like, is there a big text message or telegram group that, the, you know, the 2011, 2012 crowd is in? Um, the 2011 crowd was so tiny that there just aren't that many people from it. Like the first Bitcoin conference ever was in New York of August 2011. And there was 50 people there. I think there were two women, one of whom was my girlfriend. And... Um, you know, Roger was there and the, the BitPay guys, you know, BitPay was one of the early companies that started very early on. Um, so they were there already. But yeah, that was just small. I, I keep in touch with a lot of those people. And, you know, mainly it's like at industry conferences where we see each other. And it's um, it's cool to have, you know, lived like through a decade of this crazy ascent of Bitcoin and to see a lot of these same people. 
there's a lot of people that like haven't made it, you know, they like washed out or ended up in prison or, or all that kind of thing. So it's not all been rainbows, but um, yeah, it's been, it's been a good story. Yeah. We're, we're going to get out of the early days, but is there any story from the early days that you just think is really important to share or you're like, you know, I really hope that this one event or story or connection like doesn't get lost as the industry grows? Yeah. I mean, uh, I'll give an appeal to Silk Road. Um, Silk Road, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners know about that, but it was this online marketplace where people could buy and sell drugs and obviously controversial. Um, personally, I believe that consenting adults should be able to do whatever they want. And I felt like Silk Road made a step function advancement in people's ability to safely buy narcotics. And so if they're going to buy narcotics, I'd rather them have access to safe ones. And it was, it was an amazing project and story because not just because it was so brave to do, but because it demonstrated very early on how powerful Bitcoin was. It was a service that could not exist because of government intervention until Bitcoin came along and allowed it to allowed it to happen. Um, Ross Ulbricht, who now sits in prison for like 300 years, uh, does not deserve to be there. And I hope the people that understand this industry and that care about human liberty know that story of Silk Road, know the story of Ross and um, keep him you know, in their thoughts and are familiar with what happened. Were you close with Ross? No, I, the first time I ever talked with him or met him, he was already in jail and I went to visit him. Um, I know his mother now, she's been, you know, a tireless activist for him in all these years. So I, I met him when he was in jail and I, I talked to him for a couple hours there. Um, you know, when you talk to someone, you can kind of tell like if they're a good person or if they're really shady and he was clearly a good person. He had a lot of remorse about what happened, a lot of regret and, you know, just looked sad like his his life now has been stolen from him and yet he had the courage to build something that almost no one has the courage to do and um i think really you know he he took a bullet for the advancement of liberty so i, I think he deserves a lot of respect for that he's he's still a human you know no one should be idolized too much but um it is tragic that he's sitting in there for hundreds of years hopefully he'll get out somehow yeah when so BitInstant, the company that you Charlie's company that you joined as director of marketing, I want to start taking it from BitInstant to Shapeshift. But what did that look like? Like so, so BitInstant, the my understanding and kind of how Charlie has told it to me is that Mt. Gox was one of the only places to buy Bitcoin. It was in Japan. If you wanted to send money to Mt. Gox, you needed like, you know, it took like a week or usually two weeks. So BitInstant helped facilitate the buying of, uh, you know, you buy. Like put in put in money into BitInstant like a Seven Eleven somehow something like that, and then you guys had an account at Mt. Gox, and then so you would buy for the person. Do do I understand that decently? Yeah, that, very very well said. Yeah, it would take okay. one or two weeks to get money there, and if Bitcoin's going from five to ten dollars, you just lost half your investment. So would you pay you know two percent fee in order to get your money there this afternoon instead of two weeks from now? That was a a great uh, great business case. Um, grew very fast. I remember thinking like, this is getting crazy uh, on a day that we did like $80,000 in volume in one day. Um, today, that's like a completely insignificant sum for any crypto business, but like it had been growing so fast that we hit $80,000. And I just remember thinking like, oh my God, this is so much money. This yeah. stuff is working. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a small team. We were in, uh, in Manhattan. I think at most it ever got to like 10 people or so. And uh yeah, it was it was the way to fund money into Mt. Cox quickly and safely. Are there other folks who worked at BitInstant that people would recognize? Um, I mean, certainly the most prominent of that project were are the the Winklevoss brothers. So we met with them, taught them about Bitcoin, and to their credit, they seemed very genuinely interested in it and very they understood why it was cool. Um, they dove in, they invested in BitInstant, and we had a whole big falling out. But, uh, you know, to their credit, they started Gemini after that. And Gemini has been a, a super successful Bitcoin exchange. And to their credit, they have weathered, you know, several Bitcoin bubbles at this point. Um, so I, you know, I, I appreciate and respect that a lot. They've been an important contributor. They've been important contributors to Bitcoin. So... 
Bit instant shuts down. You immediately launch shapeshift. You take some time, or no, no. no. So then you no, have we the, um, we left the bit instant. Uh, Ira and I left bit instant in the start of 2013. Um, I, I told them like this company is going down if we're not here. Uh, two months later, they took it down because they were too worried about regulatory issues, and it never came back. And bit instant just ended up folding, kind of quietly suffocating under under regulatory paranoia. Um, so Charlie was there still for another, you know, six months. Um, and then he ended up getting arrested on a flight back from the Amsterdam Bitcoin conference in mid 2013. So then he had a whole saga for a couple of years dealing with that. Um, you know, he was in, in prison for over a year, um, for total bullshit charges. And, uh, that's a whole interesting story. You started Shapeshift a few months after Mt. Gox shut down. Why? Yeah. So my understanding is that you launched Shapeshift with the with the thesis that eventually there would be, you know, thousands or millions of these digital assets that were traded and Shapeshift would be the best place to go to exchange these digital assets. But if I'm if I'm doing the timeline correctly in my head, Mt. Gox had just shut down. There was only one digital asset. There was Bitcoin, right? And so no. how do you right? No, like even, did... even back then there were there were a number of digital currencies. Uh, um, you know, you would measure it in like dozens. Uh, even back when yeah. I got involved in 2011, there was like um, Namecoin and maybe, maybe uh, yeah, Feathercoin yeah. and a couple others. Yeah. Um, but I saw that like as time went on, people were finding more and more interesting ways to use this technology. So as a thesis, I just saw a world where there would be lots of digital assets. Some of them would be trying to be money and some wouldn't. Um, and that, you know, I didn't want everyone to deal with the custodial issue of Mt. Gox. It's dangerous both for security reasons, obviously, but uh, the principles of Bitcoin that are so important about immutability and borderlessness are not um, maintained if you trust a custodian. That always will degrade back into a banking type of uh, regulatory framework. So I wanted to give people a way to convert between these different digital assets easily and safely without us holding money for them. And um, that, that's the impetus for Shapeshift. You lost, I can only imagine what this was like, but you know, we can fast. So you, you built this really nice business. When I got into the industry in 2015, uh, you were, you know, you know, I kind of got in adjacently and like there was shape shift. And then in 2017, like you guys were one of the main players and then you lost 99% of your business due to a regulatory decision. And I think as a founder, when I learned about this and read about this, I, my, my gut reaction, I don't actually care about the, what happened with the business. I'm wondering more about the mental impact of surviving a 99%, you know, of your business getting wiped away. I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, yeah, it was a super dark time. I mean, we had gotten into 2018, we had grown, you know, reasonably large. We were like a hundred people, um, making a lot of money, everything was growing and wonderful and we were happy and like customers loved us and everything was great. And, you know, at that size, we had started really taking the whole regulatory world very seriously. And we had hired all these lawyers to help us navigate it. Well, um, you know, we're fine pushing boundaries, but we don't want to be overtly breaking laws because then we're just going to be thrown in cages and we're not anonymous. And so that's a careful line we have to walk. And we came to the conclusion that we may be treated as a financial intermediary and thus we would have to follow essentially all the rules that banks do. And um, this meant we'd have to impose uh, user accounts and KYC on all of our users. I didn't want to do that for many reasons, uh, ethical, practical, um, <laughs> engineering priority wise. Uh, I didn't want to build a big surveillance tool to spy on a bunch of innocent people. And uh, yet the rules seemed to be that we had to do that or shut down the business. So we decided to bite that bullet and implement those systems. Um, and that was also into a bear market. And so like both of those things combined meant that the vast majority of our customers just went elsewhere. And I certainly can't blame them. Um, there were lots of other companies that weren't nearly as uh, worried about the regulatory system as we were at that point. And so the customers just went there and um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, obviously we suddenly became super unprofitable and losing tons of money, but that psychological toll is really bad. And, you know, not just not just on me and the other executives of the company, but like all of the employees who 
who go from this like high flying, we're growing and everyone loves us to everyone hates us calling us a bunch of like government shills. And, you know, suddenly we're like enemy number one um, while we're losing all this money. Uh, yeah, it was, it was horrible. It was like a very dark phase for the whole company. And um, we just kind of had to endure and navigate and figure out how to get through that. So you went, you took it down from a hundred employees to what, 10? No, we, at peak, we were around 135. Um, January of 2019, we had a big public layoff where we laid off about a third of the company. So we went back to around like 70 ish and we've maintained around that level since then. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So you, did you ever think about shutting it down? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, thought about that a lot and that, you know, it was a trying question of like, with my principles, what, what is the right decision? Do I like just shut it all down? Who, who does that help? Does that actually like remove surveillance from what people are using? No, it just kind of removes one more option that people are using. And I still felt that even though we couldn't protect people's privacy anymore, we could protect them in terms of like the custodial relationship. The shapeshift was non-custodial. That was still extremely important. And we're going to keep that banner going, um, even though we have to, you know, intrude into their privacy. So that was that that tipped the scale into me thinking like, we need to keep this going for a while and, and just suffer through it. Yeah. Did you have any tools that you used to just mentally get through it? I think the, I think what I mentally used was just like zooming out and recognizing how successful the industry was. And like, I always see myself as, you know, like I'm CEO of Shapeshift, but I'm a participant in the real startup here, which is like the crypto industry. That is the startup. That's what I care about. That's what's changing the world. And so even though like my branch of that, my company was having a really hard time, the industry itself was just, it was doing everything that we imagined it would do. And it was a rocky road, but um, that was inspiring to me and that helped keep me going. Yeah. You said that the, you guys had to implement the KYC apparatus of basically spying on, you didn't want to spy on all your customers, but I think my pushback would be, you don't have to spy on your customers. And so is there something below the surface with KYC that most consumers aren't understanding? Like, does K what, what gets passed on? Like, what's happening behind the scenes with KYC that you are kind of worried and astonished to see that we don't know about? Yeah, I understand KYC now really well, obviously. Um, okay, so give us, give us the goods. <laughs> well, I can't even talk about some of it because that's illegal which itself I would say is a violation of the first amendment, but can't talk about some things, right? So draw some conclusions there. Um, I think at its most practical, when you warehouse a bunch of people's private personal information, just from a security practice, that is very bad, right? Like this is all information that can be used to exploit and steal from people. Identity theft is a massive problem. There's like $50 billion of losses from this every year in the US alone. Um, it's like the worst form of property theft derives from identity theft. And so if you're collecting all this information, you know, you, you can try to be as secure as you want with it, but you're creating a massive honeypot for hackers. And, you know, every, every type and size of company has had data breaches from the, the tiniest all the way up to like huge government agencies and the IRS itself. So, so to force a company to take a bunch of personal private information, which itself requires a huge amount of engineering effort to do that correctly and work with all these different vendors and pay a bunch of people to do various parts of it. Um, and then you have to secure it. And then you're basically just ending up with, you know, the 99.9% .9 of people that are innocent, good people, you've endangered all of them so that you can help the state maybe do a little better job of catching an occasional bad guy. To me, that just seems like such a horrible perversion of justice. Like the presumption of innocence is supposed to be a thing. If you are not even accused of a crime, you should be allowed to have financial privacy. I don't know why that's such an extreme position to take. And yet all financial regulation violates that completely. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's awful. But, you know, both from that security perspective, the, the headache of dealing with it, like if you're just trying to try out a service and you have to then like, go get your wallet and pull out your ID and then, oh, you don't have your ID and you have to like go find something else. And 
And then the systems that scan the IDs are like, they're not perfect. So you get all sorts of false positives and false negatives. And then customers are mad, even when they're a legitimate person that it like causes a cascading set of, of issues, which are wholly unnecessary and inappropriate to be imposing on people. And any financial company that deals with this stuff knows exactly what I'm talking about. Hmm. So in your vision of the world, so would everyone, should it, should everyone do away with KYC basically? Is that your vision of the world? Yeah, my vision of the world is TD Ameritrade. Well, they can't because they're coerced into doing it. They're forced by the government. And is that from the Bank Secrecy Act? Is that from like dating way back because they're financial intermediaries? They have to do this. Yeah, it's it's a complicated tapestry of things. But the Bank Secrecy Act is part of the core of of why, at least in the U.S., that all goes on. Um, So yeah, I don't. It's not fair to, to to. to tell these companies to just do away with it, like then they'd be acting illegally, you know, just yeah, as we yeah. imposed it for, for these same rules, but it should go away. I would hope politicians would wake up to find a system that is highly ineffective, like by the government's own measure, they catch something like half a percent of all the money laundering that they know about. So you, you impose this horrible system on 99% of good people in order to maybe a little bit better help you catch half of a percent of the illegal activity. Like I, you know, there's a lot of failing government programs, but that has to be up there among the worst. All right, guys, it's ad time. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. There's one company that's powering a ton of the crypto data in the space. And by crypto data, basically there's all these uh, companies, traditional financial institutions that need crypto data for you know accounting purposes, for tracking the value of their assets, for running audits, right? And so there's one company, they're called Luka, L-U-K-K-A. I've talked about them on the podcast before. They're powering some of the largest businesses in the world in both the crypto and traditional financial services space. They're the primary pricing source used by S&P Dow Jones indices for their new crypto index. So I want to uh, just throw this out there. If you guys are any sort of business that needs to value crypto assets, create financial statements, uh, perform any sort of normal accounting audit process, you guys should head on over. It's Luka, L-U-K-K-A, Luka.tech, L-U-K-K-A dot T-E-C-H forward slash empire, or just head over to Luka.tech forward slash empire, tell them I sent you, they'll take care of you. Alrighty, let me know what you think. The other day I posted on Twitter, I said, who's the best entrepreneur? Who's the entrepreneur that everyone should know in crypto, but maybe doesn't know already, right? We're not talking like the mainstream, the super big folks. Who's the best entrepreneur that's kind of under the radar in crypto? God, post went crazy, got like 300, 400 comments. There was one name that kept popping up, JP Richardson. JP Richardson at Exodus. So I thought, man, that's crazy. Exodus is one of our sponsors. Let me call him out, right? So JP Richardson, CEO of Exodus, done an amazing job building one of crypto's most loved apps. And there's a number of reasons. They got a mobile app, they got a desktop app. You can instantly exchange over a hundred different currencies. They've got interactive charts. Uh, They're fully integrated with uh, the Trezor hardware wallet, so you can always be secure. So if you're looking to buy crypto, if you're looking to just get away from just buying one or two currencies, you want to explore other things, go to exodus.com forward slash empire or just search Exodus in the uh, App Store or Play Store. Check them out. Shoot me a DM on Twitter. Let me know what you thought. Go follow JP Richardson. Go check out Exodus. All right, exodus.com forward slash empire. So when did when did DeFi get on your radar? I want to start talking about DeFi and how you yeah. guys have transitioned into a DAO and your thoughts on DAOs, but maybe take us back to when you first when DeFi first got on your radar. Yeah, um, DeFi probably fell on my radar in like 2019, uh, and I didn't quite know what it meant yet. A lot of those apps were like pretty clunky. By 2020, it was impossible to ignore, and um, I started really looking at a lot of it. What really got me hooked and interested was Uniswap. And um, Uniswap had been around for an entire year, at least, before I took much notice of it, and that's on me. Um, but they had basically created you know, what Shapeshift had done years earlier, but they did it in a, a fully non-intermediated way, where you could d- convert from one asset to another without anyone, uh, any party doing the trade. And they did this using this um, AMM, or Automated Market Maker Model, 
these liquidity pools. And it was an entirely different way of doing exchange from a traditional order book. So I had to learn about that. And, um, you know, I used it and it was just so elegant. It was like trade one asset into another. And there you go. It's pretty um, beautiful, isn't it? It's no, beautiful. No KYC, yeah. And, yeah. 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 Like, you know, lots of the, much of the essence that we built at Shapeshift, I found immediately when I used Uniswap and I was like, they, they did it. This is it. How are they doing this? What are the, what do they know that I, that I don't and, and what can we use from this? So I started really trying to learn about that whole world and the, the DeFi world of these Ethereum smart contracts. And, um, you know, it obviously goes far beyond exchange at this point, but there's so much cool innovation in that stuff. And it's really hard to keep up with it because there's like new projects every week. And um, a lot of it is garbage. You know, there's tons of stupid projects and scams out there, of course. But uh, I think those of us in the industry have an obligation to help weed through that stuff and find the really interesting and valuable projects. And there are so many. When did you, was there a, I remember speaking with Sam Bankman Fried and he said, look, I run a centralized exchange right now, but the future is decentralized. And so we want to start building. So they're building, right? Like Serum on top of Solana. I think I'm getting the name of their decentralized exchange, right? And so it, clearly at one point, Sam recognized that, okay, the future is decentralized. Yes, something like FTX, we want to have it take over the world clearly, but you know, the future is decentralized. Did you have like a one moment where you're like, oh my God, like what I'm building with Shapeshift is not going to keep up, you know, with the pace of things like Uniswap and Balancer and things like this? Yeah, I think what helped me see that was like um, the process of token additions. So, you know, like we can all acknowledge that most of the new tokens are garbage, right? Fine. But there's a lot that are cool and the market has to like suss this stuff out and figure it out. And so it's important that people can trade these things. Um, and as Shapeshift, as a centralized company, you know, we have to be very careful about the SEC. So we can't list any asset on Shapeshift that could be deemed a security. Of course, the SEC won't tell you which coins are securities and which are not, even though they say it's clear, it's totally not. And they cannot and will not give you a list of these things. So we have to be super conservative because obviously we're under a microscope and we can't add all the cool new tokens because it takes too long for them to go through the review. Meanwhile, Uniswap comes along. It's this open protocol. And in the time that it takes Shapeshift to like add two coins, um, Uniswap could have 500 assets just like appear in it from people adding it themselves through these like through these contracts. That really pointed to me that like the friction imposed by the regulations is unworkable. Any company that has to suffer under that is going to be outcompeted by these decentralized protocols that do not have that friction. And so that the the token selection was like just one example of this. Um, and so, you know, but if we're a company, like we, we can't, we can't get around that. So yeah. we're not going to be a company. What does that mean? Yeah. So this is what we announced yesterday on the 14th of July. Shapeshift is decentralizing itself completely. So we are this, you know, traditional VC backed, uh, corporate entity. We're based in Switzerland. We have subsidiaries, we have bank accounts. We have W2 employees, we have a billion contracts with different vendors, all the normal trappings of a corporation. We're going to be dismantling all of that. And we're going to be open sourcing the entire Shapeshift platform, front end, back end, uh, mobile, desktop, everything over time. We are moving the governance of this project and the economic value accrual of this project to, from um, shares and equity to um, the token, the Fox token. So we open source and we move everything to be oriented around the Fox token instead of being closed source centralized and everything oriented around the, uh, the cap table. So this is like a very new kind of concept. A year ago, I would not have thought that this was possible, but in the DeFi world, these projects are building all these tools that they need to do that. And there's a lot of really cool tools now. And so, using those tools, using a, you know the principles of open source software development and recognizing that the most important thing we can do is build toward a vision of a decentralized financial future. We're gonna start with ourselves and decentralized shapeshift so that we can best, uh, best meet that. All right, I wanna go really actually into the weeds here because I think a lot of folks, I, I told some people I was interviewing you and they said, 
there's all this information about DAOs that's popping up, right? There's like nice medium posts that are 10 minutes long and they talk about what are DAOs yeah. and why are they cool and what are the, some of the, you know, obviously the tools are starting to get some venture investment, but what I couldn't find anywhere is like really how this works. So the first question I have is you call the VCs who invested in Shapeshift and you say, we're decentralizing the company. How did that conversation, how did that conversation go? I mean, that's not even the first conversation, of course. It's like internally, um, internally you tell the is this the even a good say, idea right like yeah, should yeah. should we do this and if so how what do we need to figure out what's the order of operations here what are these weird tools and um and then you know kind of pitch it to to our board and and show them that like this is actually strategically in the best interest of all stakeholders our shareholders our employees and our customers and like if any one of those three groups would be harmed by this uh, it probably couldn't work so we had to figure out a way to make all three of those stakeholder groups benefit, and we we have. So that involves all three of those stakeholder groups getting Fox tokens, so they all share in the governance of the platform and in the economic upside of uh, any economic utility that is generated on the platform. Um, it means that the you know the balance sheet of Shapeshift ultimately gets liquidated out to the shareholders, and. It means that we need to open up our technology so that the whole world can contribute to it. It can't come from this like closed process internally where we have 20 engineers and like we build everything ourselves. It has to morph into a, an open source structure. And so that alone is you know a huge project to take a, a large closed source um, system and, and open that up safely. So all those things we have to work on, there, you know, there's tons of like tax issues as we wind down the entity. Um, you know, we have to make sure we treat our employees right, because eventually it means all of them are losing their normal W-2 salary. That's obviously scary, right? But I want to make sure that they are better off too. So they have a bunch of Fox tokens. They can contribute far more flexibly now. They don't have to have like a normal nine to five job. They, ha they can have a much better quality of life and they can actually make a bunch more money doing it this way than they could under the normal paycheck system. But it's, it's like, it's new and we're going to make a bunch of mistakes while we do this. And we're just going to try to you know, push this as far as we can and um, see what we can do. When did you guys start working on this? We started integrating decentralized exchanges back in the fall of last year at, uh, with with Uniswap. That was, we did not at that time know that we were going to decentralize the company. Um, when we released that and we released the ThorChain integration in April, the community feedback was so positive it was you know like after two or three years of this miserable like shapeshift is the enemy because of kyc it was the complete 180 like yes this is what we as the consumers want you guys are doing a good thing here we applaud that and so we took note of that and we're like okay this is like we're moving in a good direction here um and then you know seeing all this DeFi stuff continue to grow and seeing like something like uniswap achieving uh, more trade volumes than Coinbase on certain days, you really have to think, what is the reason for a centralized entity? If you're building crypto technology and you're trying to build something for the world, why do you need to be a, a centralized entity? And you just start trying to knock down all the reasons why it can't work. Um, so I think we we started seriously considering it, you know, me and my co-founder, John, in around February. Um, as an executive team, we were discussing it heavily in April. I think all the employees were in the know by by May. Uh, we had decided and voted and everything as a board um, by the end of May, and then just mm -hmm. just yesterday on the fourteenth of July was the the public announcement. Has anyone ever done this before? At this scale, I don't think so. Um, there's no model. There's a you, lot... had no one, you had no one to look at to say we let's follow what they just did. Yeah, there's a lot of crypto projects which are centralized companies and they have built a decentralized protocol and they run both together. Like Uniswap is a great example. They have an office in Brooklyn. I don't think they're trying to get rid of that whole structure in that company. And they built this this um, open source decentralized protocol. So that's, a, that's similar. But what we're trying to do is go from a fully centralized company to dissolving that thing and becoming a completely decentralized open source project. I don't believe any company, especially at scale, has done that before. Certainly that are like, you know, VC backed with all the, the traditional trappings of, of that system. So can you walk me through if I'm an employee, let's say I'm the, I'm the VP of marketing at Shapeshift and I own 1% of Shapeshift. Mm -hmm. Are you, am I basically going to get granted 1% of all Fox tokens in existence? Like how am I 
Like, what, what does that actually mean for me, the employee? Yeah. So, well, for, as the employee or as a shareholder? I guess as I'm so as, as an employee, actually, like if I'm an employee of Shapeshift right now, what does that yeah. mean for me? And, and you said I have the opportunity to earn more than I did before. And also, I don't have to be a W2 employee. And I'm so I have a bunch of questions, but let's start with like, how yeah. am, I, so like why am all, I still getting that 1%? Like, how am I incentivized on the upside? Yeah, so all all employees of Shapeshift are shareholders. Um, you know, some of them own, you know, small amounts, but they're all shareholders to some degree. All employees received a relatively large grant of tokens, of Fox tokens. These vest over three years, unlocking through a stable or smart contract where every Ethereum block that happens, a, a tiny fraction of them unlock over three years. So even after Shapeshift is gone, those payments to them will continue. Um, the investors, the shareholders have the same thing. They all got a bunch of tokens. In that case, it's pro rata based on their shares in the company. And um, they get that over three years vesting as well. So it aligns both those groups with the long-term success of the project. Um, they don't end up with the same portion of Fox tokens that they have of the company, because obviously that math doesn't work, right? 100% of Shapeshift equity is owned by a few dozen parties. We need to decentralize, which means that, you know, the majority of the project's control and ownership ultimately has to reside outside of any insiders. So um, I think it's somewhere in the like 20 to 30% range of the tokens are going to insiders and the majority, you know, over 50%, over 60% maybe are going to the broader community. Um, and that's both from the airdrop that we did yesterday that went out to over a million uh, participants over a million different uh, entities received. So there are there are a million um, people now who are uh, owners of Shapeshift now. Yeah, it's hard to know if they're all individual people because these are all like uh, addresses that have there interacted are with addresses, Shapeshift. I guess I'd say, yeah. Yeah, re recipients, right? Some of these are like DeFi token holders. Um, we we included like the entire Thorchain community and the Uniswap community into uh, the Shapeshift airdrop. Um, so it was a it was around eight hundred thousand. Uh, Shapeshift customers throughout the past, and then two or three hundred thousand uh, participants from various different DeFi communities, and so all of them got got an, an amount of Fox. You know, the smallest amount is a couple hundred dollars worth, ranging up to a few thousand dollars worth. Hmm. What is the biggest? What are you nervous about with this? There's so many so many unforeseen things. Like, what is the biggest thing that kind of keeps you up at night with this right now? Well, early, the biggest thing was just seeing, just hoping that like our board would be open-minded about this idea. You know, um, it is very new. Like you said, like no one has really done this from the perspective of like a corporate board governance perspective. So just hoping that they would see that this was in their interest and in the interest of the shareholders that they have an obligation to. Um, fortunately, they did. They saw this as like, really cool they they have financial upside they get liquidity as we li liquidate our balance sheet and they get to be part of you know a potentially revolutionary change in how businesses can operate so to their credit they were on board and that was good um you know then i was worried about how the employees would take it uh i didn't know if like you know only one percent of them would think this was cool or if all of them would or whatever i think the vast majority of them are pretty excited about this. You know, obviously not everyone and some are, you know, not happy that they're going to lose their standard paycheck. And that's, that's understandable. Um, we're moving to a much more entrepreneurial model and that's not appropriate for some people and others thrive in it, but we got the vast majority of them on board. And then at this point, I'm just nervous about things we don't know how to do. Like, I don't know how to build a, a DAO. We've never done that before. Um, we have good people inside the company that are very familiar with this stuff, but it's all it's all new. We can make a million mistakes, and we will. So I'm just I'm hoping we can execute on it well, and I'm hoping that we do a good job of communicating what we're trying to build to people and why they should get involved, and you know, kind of that value proposition. So if I'm that VP of marketer that we talked about five minutes ago, and so I'm losing my salary, right? I'm losing my biweekly paycheck. How am I getting yep. paid by the company now? How, or how, well, the or by the, there's no company. How is the DAO paying me? Yeah, so you've already received a grant of tokens that vest over three years in tiny increments. So Who's telling me what go. to work on? So uh, just from that reward alone, you don't have to do anything at that point, right? Like 
All of our employees have certain dates that they need to stay with us to. And after that, they are free agents. Some of them will totally leave and go off to other projects. Some of them will continue working on Shapeshift part-time. Some of them will work on it full-time. All of them have a strong, vested, long-term interest in the success of the token. So part of the experimentation here is how much incentive you have to like force on people versus how much incentive they can come to their own conclusions on. Um, past that grant, anyone who wants to get paid for specific work, and this is whether you're a current Shapeshift employee or a new person in the community that wants to, there is a process by which you communicate with other parts of the community, you propose things, and ultimately large grants of money get voted on by the DAO, which has a massive treasury, uh, and it will fund various people and projects that do good work. Hmm. So that's, you know, that is a, a somewhat messy process, but a lot of the tools to do that well, like these forums and these governance, um, there, there's like on-chain governance tools where the governance happens on-chain and it can actually happen without gas fees. So you can actually do like on-chain governance without any transactions going on. Um, and then based on the results of these votes, actual on-chain transactions from treasuries that are held in multi-sig arrangements can actually pay destination addresses. See, and this is all like new tooling that's just been built over the last year. So, and I expect that will continue. So the, the tools to run a DAO are still very adolescent, but they're getting better. And I think in a year or two, it's going to be like a, you know, a golden age of economic organization. And, and this is really like a new way for organizations to build themselves in the 21st century. We were talking to Robert Leshner from Compound and he said, one of the best investment opportunities right now is tools that support DAOs. So, yeah, I think that'll be a huge, huge yeah. industry. You know, just as when the internet came out, like so, so many tools for internet work had to get built that make the internet highly functional today. Yeah. We're just at the start of that process with DAOs. Do you, um, actually, before jumping to something else, so. I'm more, I'm still curious about the decision making of a DAO. So let's okay. So Blockworks. By the time this episode comes out, Blockworks will have announced that we're hosting a 5,000 person DeFi conference. It's called Permissionless. Cool. It's going to be really badass. Uh, it's going to be the best thing that we've ever done. I'm so so excited I go. about it. Yeah, it's going to be great. You should speak. And um, when say say we want to pitch Shapeshift on a sponsorship, right? Yeah. Previously, we've spoken with Shapeshifts like VP of Marketing or CMO. Yep. But we, if we want to sell shape sh or try to sell Shapeshift like a hundred thousand dollar sponsorship, who are we pitching now? The DAO yeah. and the token holders. Yes, and you would do that by going into the forums. At first, you would want to casually run the idea by people, so you'll post something that's not a vote; it's an idea. You know, and the more specifics, the better. Like, you, know, you guys are putting on this conference. Here are the dates. Here's where it is. Uh, you want a hundred thousand dollars, and here's what Shapeshift gets in return for that. If there's good sentiment for that, then you would turn it into a formal proposal. That formal proposal can get voted on. It'll have a period where quorum has to get reached and um, people will vote. You know, anyone that's holding Fox tokens can vote on that. And if it passes, then the money can get unlocked and sent to you guys. And then everything else can follow from that. It's fascinating. Yeah, it's, you know, like it's a lot of, it's the attempt at recreating the important elements of what a corporation does while getting rid of the cruft, like the, the regulatory, the jurisdictional, the bureaucracy cruft that has built up over a hundred years of corporations getting built. And these things were very important for in, in the industrial age, still are. I don't think like every company should become a DAO or anything like that. But as we're in like this digital world, and especially for those of us building projects that we want to be immutable and borderless, there is a new a new way to organize um, economically. You know, it's not just like it's not just a bunch of volunteers with a passion project. It's like people making real money, doing good work, and building together toward a common vision, without like a Delaware C corp being involved, without a bank account whatsoever. Um, so it's, it's exciting, you know, and as, as someone who has seen the bureaucracy that creeps into a company, even as relatively small as Shapeshift at, you know, 50 or 100 people, so much of our time and energy went into things that was not the product for the users. That's what we should be focusing on. And my hope is that with this, with this change, that will actually become 
you know, 95% of the focus instead of 40 or 50. Will, uh, will Uniswap be bigger than Coinbase in a decade? Will, will, will Aave be bigger than BlockFi in a decade? Five years? Yeah. Um, I think, I don't know about those specific names, but I think your more important question there is, will the best DeFi protocols be bigger yeah. than the centralized counterparts? I believe that, that they will. Um, I'm a big fan of both Coinbase and BlockFi. I'm a customer of both. You know, I have, I have money at both. I've used BlockFi as like collateral backs loan. Um, I've borrowed money. I've lent money through them. Cool service. And then I've used Aave like this decentralized protocol where I can just like put up ETH and pull out a stable coin in like five seconds with no KYC. And I could do it from anywhere in the world, regardless of territory restrictions. And I don't have to wait three days for an approval to withdraw. The user experience of that is just an order of magnitude better. And this is still early days for these DeFi projects. They're still relatively young. So as they get better, like that's just going to blow any kind of centralized custodian out of the water. Um, and it, you know, that does not mean that I don't think Coinbase and BlockFi will be very successful businesses and make a bunch of money. They have been, they are, and I think they'll be successful into the future. But in terms of proportional growth, the DeFi protocols are going to have far more proportional growth than the centralized custodians. Hmm. Do you, I guess to further that question, like, do you think that most companies, do you think if you're launching a company today, let's say you're an entrepreneur and you're really interested in crypto, you've been in the industry for a few years, you know, a decent bit about it. And you've got some investors, you've got a great idea. Would you launch it as a DAO? It, it depends on the specifics, you know, like I, I don't think you can, for, for some, the answer should be yes. For some, the answer should be no. Again, I don't think every company should be a DAO, but people should learn about these tools and they should think like, which model is better? One in which we're the centralized company or one where we're, this, we're a DAO. And they don't have to be mutually exclusive. You know, like Shapeshift has been a centralized company and we have discovered a way in which to make ourselves a DAO. So we're going to pursue it. Um, and then there are companies like Uniswap that are both a, a decentralized protocol and a centralized corporation and sort of a sort of a DAO in the middle of them. Um, so I think it's just important for people to experiment with this stuff. You know, the the best practices have not all been set or established yet. I'm convinced that DAOs and DeFi is really going to go mainstream when it's only when it's forced to go mainstream. And by that, I mean, I think that, I mean, you would have a much better take than I would because you've just been in the industry and you've dealt with the regulators. But I think that Bitcoin and, and ETH haven't faced our like our big boss yet to say. No, haven't. And I think we're actually a ways away from that. And when we face the big boss is when the US dollar really starts slipping and Bitcoin yep. And ETH become a lot more popular and it actually be, you know, the regulators and the government sees Bitcoin as a competitor to the US dollar, which even though I know we like to say that on Bitcoin and crypto Twitter, that's not actually how they view it yet. And I think that yeah, they, they still got to a face lot of the big boss. Yeah, we're gonna have yeah. to face the big boss when when they actually view Bitcoin as a competitor. And that's when I think DAOs and DeFi will really take off because you're, you're going to be forced to use them if you still want to operate in crypto. Yeah, you, you may be right about that. Um, and as much as I will like cheer on the decentralized products for being available to people, that's also going to be like a very terrifying and scary time. Because that, that, that means like where fiat currencies are actually uh, falling apart and billions of people are going to be like thrust into poverty and despair. It's going to be like a, a really horrible time. Um, that horrible jolt will certainly wake people up to the failings of fiat and central banking, but I don't, I don't want them to, I don't want them to make the transition on that, um, impetus. I would rather they start learning about this stuff before that catastrophe and they start getting comfortable with it now. So, but you know, I've been in this for 10 years trying to tell people that like, this is the future. This, this is sound money. This is the way that finance should, should operate. So all we can do is continue preaching that message, I think, and, and hoping most, hoping as many people as possible learn about these tools before they're forced to. Do you think that fiat eventually goes away? Yeah, <laughs> I do. Um, it's not five years from now, but yeah, it goes away because Given the choice, who would want it? 
Like, wh why would you choose it? The only reasons today, which are good reasons today, but which will fail over time, is that it is more stable than Bitcoin. And you're used to using it and everyone accepts it. These are transient things. These are things that will be eaten away at as people become used to Bitcoin. As it grows, it has become more stable. And as these like algorithmic stable coins come along, now suddenly you don't need to get into banks and fiat at all in order to have an asset with a stable value. Um, so I think, you know, with time, let's call it 10 to 30 years, uh, we will see fiat go away. And what, what the world will be left with is an actual open market in money, market-based money, where, you know, that doesn't mean that there are like 10,000 monies because that would be super inefficient. Maybe Bitcoin ends up being like the primary form of money, but I think there will be a lot of other digital assets doing various different things. Uh, and people will just get used to having a financial system based on markets, just as they have like, you know, the restaurant industry based on markets, or they have the entertainment industry based on markets. You have competing um, merchants and vendors and creators doing these things instead of one monolithic central bank governing how money works for the world. So yeah, I think that's the transition we're heading to and, and all of the best work in the cryptocurrency industry needs to be going toward that future. Hmm. The question that most people DM'd me about, which I don't know why you've become like the poster boy for uh, uh, like Bitcoin, ETH, crypto, tw the crypto Twitter question but that I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you is um, everyone just wants to hear your thoughts on why on uh, on like Bitcoin maximalism and what you think of Bitcoin maximalism. And I feel kind of silly asking the question because I've heard you answer it before, but that was, that was the overwhelmingly the most, most asked question of me <laughs> to ask you. So I wanted to ask you, what are your updated a, thoughts on Bitcoin maximalism? It's a good question. It's relevant. I, I like talking about it and I think it's important. Um, I think, well, I think I get pulled into this a lot because both because I used to be a maximalist um, and I've been like an OG in Bitcoin for a very long time. Um, and I also have embraced a like plurality in coins very vocally where I appreciate more than one digital asset and I'm not ashamed to say that. So, and I, the, the thing, the, the, the worst poison I'll put it this way. The worst poison that I see in this industry right now is this religious tribalism that has developed in which you attach on to your preferred asset. You believe it is all that is good and, and all the other is bad. You know, like Bitcoin versus everything being shitcoin. Like that's the ultimate meme of this type of thinking. And there is always like some elements of truth to these things. And there are some good principles that maximalists have. And they can point to, of course, thousands of projects that are stupid or scams and use that to justify and rationalize why their project is the only one worth considering. But frankly, I think it's, it's intellectual laziness. And more importantly, the decentralization that is so important to Bitcoin is best expressed when you have actually a whole plurality of different assets built with different code bases, with different engineering teams that have different principles, they make different design trade-offs and how these blockchains work. You can, a, a, a blockchain is like a feat of engineering which requires trade-offs and you cannot build one blockchain that is like the best at everything. So of course we should have multiple blockchains and not every asset is trying to be base money. So of course we should have different digital assets. NFTs are not trying to be base money, right? So, so like, using these arguments that like all money congeals into whatever is the best one, which comes from like, I'd say very sound Austrian economic arguments does not apply when you're talking about an NFT or does not apply when you're talking about like um, a liquidity pool token that gives you a right to pull out like a, a certain degree of interest from a liquidity pool. So I'm saddened that the people who were so excited and open-minded about this new technology called Bitcoin, have since calcified around that and closed their mind to all of the amazing continued experimentation and innovation that's happening on these other chains. Um, so I, I am not a maximalist anymore. You know, I have, I have grown out of that and I appreciate Ethereum greatly. I appreciate Monero and Zcash, you know, like for building something that is more private than Bitcoin. A lot of people don't realize how surveilled Bitcoin as a blockchain is. Um, 
I appreciate the experimentation that's happening. And even though there's a lot of garbage out there, I think it's worth paying attention to the good stuff. I will. Uh, yeah. I think that was more eloquent than I could have said it. I, I think it really frustrates me. Um, yeah, I think it really frustrates me. I don't know. I think that we got into this industry and got so passionate about it and you can ride out the bear markets because you're building something amazing that's kind of taking on this financial system and trying to eat it away from the inside out. And then you have things like Uniswap and Compound and Aave that are honestly, when you use them, like it feels like magic. It really feels like magic yeah. and, it, and it's amazing. It's decentralized and there's no central entity. And then I talk about it on Twitter and I say, I enjoy using Uniswap and get berated by, by Bitcoiners. I don't know. It just feel, I, it's comical, but also a little bit sad and also makes me think that a lot of these folks have, have forgotten why we're doing this. A lot of them have. Um, their principles, sadly, have largely moved from like uh, ideological principles of like decentralization and, and liberty to, the, to Bitcoin being the principle. And that's now what they worship. And what that causes is that you will sacrifice a good project that's not Bitcoin, even though it is better at the principles that you originally believed in. The privacy coins are the perfect example of this. Nearly every Bitcoiner that was into this stuff early cared about privacy, and most of them still believe it's important. They believe that anonymity is valuable and legitimate and important. Bitcoin is objectively less anonymous than Zcash and Monero. So how can you possibly dismiss those things as shit coins if you care about financial privacy? It's reasonable to say, you know, I respect that, but I just don't want to own any of it. That's fine. It doesn't mean you need to own these things or invest in them, but to outright dismiss them because they're not your coin um, is really, you know, losing the plot, frankly. And, you know, if, if I'm going to go into this a little more, I think a lot of the maximalists are frankly too scared to go up against the big boss, which is government, which is regulators. They are too timid to take any material steps to advance the stuff against that real boss. And so they take cheap shots at each other on Twitter and pretend that they're being a hero. Do, do you just ignore it? No, I mean, maybe I should, but I'm, I'm addicted to crypto Twitter as much as, as much as any of us. Good. I think Glad part of me feels like hopefully I can prevent some people from becoming maxis, or maybe I can convert one of them to not be anymore. Mostly. I just don't want many people to slide into that poisonous mindset. And it's interesting to see that mindset develop in Ethereum. Like there are Ethereum maximalists that have all the same psychological traits that you find in the Bitcoin maximalists um, and, and are all wrong for the same reason. Yeah. I Last note on this. And I think it, one of the other reasons I think it's absurd is that you see the SEC, like you see the accreditation, uh, accredited investor rules. And you're like, that's absurd. We should, you know, people should have complete control to do what they want over their money. That's ridiculous that we impose these accredited investor laws on anyone in America. And then I say that I might buy some Ethereum and people say that's ridiculous. And they try to basically act as the SEC. And they're, you oftentimes when you talk to these folks, their reasoning is that they're trying to protect the consumer. Right? I'll, they're trying to protect I'll, the consumer of from I'll counter from that a little bit. Coins. I'll counter that a little bit because I, I think it's always fair to argue to someone that they shouldn't do something. I have no problem with a with a maxi, you know, telling you you shouldn't buy something and then like debating that outright. Like all that is is speech at the end of the day. That's not ethically wrong of them, even if they might be wrong about the opinion. The SEC is different. They're not just telling you. Uh, they're not just providing advice. They're not just speaking. They're actually using coercion. They're blocking you. To, yeah, yeah. to to find, to steal, to imprison people who make the decisions that they don't want them to make. So, I, you know, as much as I dislike the maxis, I'm not going to put them as low as as the SEC or a government regulator. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, all right, Eric, let's yeah. start to wrap this up. I've um, I have a few questions for you. I'm I'm just really curious how you go about learning. Um, you've been in the industry for so long, and it's really easy to to just probably sit back and I don't know how much money you've made off Bitcoin, but I'm assuming it's a lot of money. And so like, it's probably pretty easy to get like a little bit lazy, but this industry moves so quickly. So I, I think I found myself really impressed by how much you're still able to innovate um, and, and stay attuned with DeFi and lead the way with DAOs. Um, and I find it really impressive. So I'm curious, how do you go about learning um, and just staying yeah. in tune with what's going on? 
Uh, I mean, you know, if I'm being honest, part of it is just like necessity being the mother of invention. You know, and I like I don't need to run Shapeshift for money reasons, but I care about Shapeshift and I care about the principles of decentralization and, and self custody. So I have been trying to find how to build Shapeshift in a way that that isn't illegal, but can still create the kind of application and user experience that I that I value. So I've had to follow this stuff because I've been looking for a way out of what we got trapped in. Um, more high level, I mean, the the way to learn about stuff is just to use it. So if you're confused about DeFi, like, you know, you could go read a few articles about it or go use Aave. Go use Aave. Go, go take 10 Ethereum and like get a, a loan from Aave in a stable coin. Take that stable coin to another DeFi protocol and, and earn interest in a liquidity pool. Like go go through that flow, and you will learn about a whole magical new world of cool stuff that's happening, uh, more than any article can ever explain. Yeah. Um, what founder? What founder or just entrepreneurs in general do you admire right now, in crypto or out of crypto? Um. I yeah. I mean, I gotta say, I I admire um, CZ and and Sam Bankman Fried uh, for the speed with which they rose up and built something that is huge you know like you, you got to respect that um cz you know it, he is someone who certainly pushes some boundaries and yet has maintained as the leading exchange of the world for longer than anyone else in crypto history there was a long time where every year a new exchange would take the the crown and that crown has sat with it with binance now for a few years so that's impressive um you know i i do want to give some some credit to um, Brian Armstrong at, at Coinbase. I, he gets he gets a lot of hate because it's always easy to hate on like the big established corporation. But Brian built from nothing the most important crypto company out there and has helped establish this entire industry in the mind of the mainstream. Um, so even though I think self custody is important, and even though you know I don't like a lot of the things that Coinbase is forced to do. They have been so important for the whole industry and they have stuck with it and built something great. Um, so I, I got to respect that. All right, we can wrap it up. I'll ask you the same question that uh, I ask everybody and then you can flip the interview and ask me one question if you want. So the question I ask everyone is just, what is one thing that's maybe keeping you up at night right now or that you're worried about for the future that you think some folks in the audience, some of the listeners might be able to help you out with? That someone could help me out with? Someone can help all, you out all, with the, yeah go ahead all my all my fears have to do with like what horrible actions regulators will take to harm peaceful people so so let's go uh, there so what so what is yeah. that fear i just you you have this form of money that cannot be controlled and you have these institutions who only exist to control money and they have like gone head on at each other the regulators are not going to be pleased with this and it's going to be a battle for a long time um so I worry about what they will do to interfere and harm and steal from peaceful individuals who are just voluntarily trading with each other. That's, you know, that's been my, that was my biggest fear 10 years ago when I first learned about Bitcoin. It's my biggest fear today. Hmm. When will you not be scared of that? I think if I wasn't like on the front lines in the industry, then I would be less afraid of it. Um, cause I wouldn't be personally at risk. Yeah. So that's the biggest deal. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We can flip it. You can ask me one question. Okay. Tell me about a project that I should learn about that I might not know. Mm. That's cool. Um, I think the company that, um, I mean, I'm assuming, you know, all the big DeFi um, platforms right now. So, so I won't go there, I, but I think honestly, the listeners, if they haven't spent some time, honestly going on DeFi pulse and just looking at the top projects like Aave and balancer and compound and Uniswap, I would really urge a lot of the listeners to just pull up this website called DeFi pulse that tracks the state of the DeFi industry and just go play around with those. Um, but for you, Eric, I mean, I, Again, I'm assuming you know a lot of the companies, but Multicoin just led a $9 million round in a company called ooh, Superfluid, Superfluous, Superfluid, I think it is, yesterday. Do you know mm -hmm. of this company? I don't. All right. So I would type in, go, and everyone else can do this too, type in Multicoin Superfluid on Google, 
and you will okay. basically read about a company that just is basically trying to do streaming payment flows. Um, I talked to the Multicoin guys yesterday. They think it's one of the most interesting companies they've ever invested in. And it's a new protocol that, that in, in their words, represents the biggest step forward in value transfer since the advent of Bitcoin. And really, I think what it's allowed Whoa, you to big, do- Big words. Yeah, big, yeah, big statement, big statement. Um, Cool. So I will, I can put the link in the YouTube or in the podcast, but it really it allows you to just, I think, stream payments in real time. Um, and it's, I think, going to be the, the backbone of DAO payment. It, it'll, it'll be the payments infrastructure for DAOs. Um, so, cool. Yeah, well, this is super, something like, it allows that, DAOs that to, we can probably use. Yeah, it allows DAOs to authorize a single transaction to pay contractors indefinitely or until the end of an assignment. It can be used for like DAO to DAO interactions. Uh, it can be used for IoT. It could be used for DeFi. So I think it's a really interesting company. Cool. Thank you yeah. for telling me. I'll look into them. Yeah, of course. Eric, thank you, my friend. Thank you for uh, giving me an hour of your time, hour and a half of your time. Yeah. I, I really appreciate it. And honestly, just really big fan of how much you've been able to innovate. And uh, on a founder level, I really respect the hell out of what you've done, kind of building from... You know, having a company that got hit really hard and was it was honestly out of your control and building back it's it's really really impressive so thanks good work i i appreciate that it's been a good conversation yeah likewise